Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the sanctuary service of Broadmoor United Methodist Church. My name is Donnie Wilkinson. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so grateful that you are joining us in worship today. As we prepare for our time of worship, allow our pre-service music to bring you into God's presence. In our worship today, may we look to Jesus to restore our spiritual vision so that we may know who he truly is and what he can do in our life.
Great God of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys for bright and song. Heart of my own heart, whatever be As a sign of our unity and love for one another, let us affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed, followed by that ancient hymn of faith, Gloria Patri. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead and ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I'm Tom Cook. I'm one of the associate pastors here. I'm going to be preaching this morning on a passage from Mark that you would have read, or you will be reading, where Bartimaeus sees Jesus and calls him the son of David, the Messiah. This is an important passage because it happens right before Jesus goes to Jerusalem, is crucified and resurrected, and it reminds us of Lent. So let's pray together this morning. Father God, this time of year, Lent, where we're waiting for Easter, we have this wonderful anticipation. But Lord, we also know Easter includes Good Friday and the sacrifice you made for us on the cross. Help us to recognize you as the Son of David, the Messiah, our Savior. Lord, help us to, to know what you did for us. And Lord, help us to be examples of Christ for everyone we come in contact with. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to be the light of the world. I pray for this in Christ's name. Amen. And now let us pray together that prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. We're going to continue our sermon series entitled, Who Do You Say That I Am? This morning, I want to focus on a passage in Mark where Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, calls Jesus the Son of David. But before we begin, will you pray with me just one more time? Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you because you're our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today's scripture comes from the 10th chapter of Mark, the 46th through the 52nd verses. I'm going to read it in just a minute. You can pull it up on your iPhone, you can pull it up on your tablet, or if you're old school, you can actually open your Bible and read it. If none of those are available to you, then the words will be printed on the screen. Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing off his cloak, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. The word of God for the people of God. This is an important story of healing, and it's included in all three synoptic gospels. It's included in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now remember, Mark was written first, and sections of Matthew and Luke are copied from Mark. I want to unpack this passage a little because there's, there's some things going on in the background that you might not be aware of. We're going to do some exegesis, and that's just a fancy term theolog theologians use when they, they simply want to do some interpretation or explanation of the text. This passage is part of a larger section of Mark. It's really included in ch chapters 8 through 11. The, in these chapters, we have two stories of healing blind men. One that comes in chapter 8, the beginning of chapter 8, where he heals the, man, the blind man in Bethsaida. And the other one is the one I just read to you about Bartimaeus. Between these two stories, Jesus travels with his disciples to Jerusalem. On the way, he tells the disciples three times of his coming death. But they respond to each of these predictions inappropriately showing that they're blind to the future that Jesus is trying to reveal to them. Mark uses these two stories of blind men to bracket a series of stories to show that the disciples are spiritually blind. They're asking for things. They're, they're choosing poorly. They just don't get it. Peter, James, and John asked to be made special when Jesus comes into his kingdom, and Jesus tells them that they must be servants. This section also includes the story of the rich young ruler who, who asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. When Jesus tells him to sell all his possessions, he walks away dismayed. None of them get the answer from Jesus that they expect. The story of Bartimaeus is the last healing miracle of Mark's gospel, and it ends chapter 10. Chapter 11 introduces Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which, of course, is the prelude to his crucifixion and resurrection. It was the custom for everyone who could to go to the temple in Jerusalem for Passover celebration. They would often go with their rabbi or teacher, 
and he would teach them as they went along the way. They'd walk along the way, and he'd be teaching them. So it was most likely a parade that was following Jesus, listening to him teach. And they, come, they came to Jericho, which is about 15 or 20 miles downhill from Jerusalem. So let me show you a slide of where that is. The town of Jericho is one of the oldest inhabited cities in the world. It's where the walls came down when the Israelites came into the Promised Land. It would have been a very busy, well-established city. Jesus is likely surrounded by people when the blind beggar named Bartimaeus starts to shout at him. Now, let, let's look at the meaning of his name, Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus means son of in Aramaic. Aramaic is a language that's it's similar to Hebrew, and it's the common language of the Palestinian Jews in, in Jesus' day. Mark gives the Aramaic name Bartimaeus and then translates it into Greek, the son of Timaeus, for the Gentile readers. Bar means son. Timaeo means honor. So Bartimaeus means son of honor. You know, the man's circumstances, a blind beggar, kind of stand at odds with the pretentious name son of honor. As a blind beggar, he lives on the margins of society. But Jesus will show him respect and restore his sight so that the man might reclaim the honor accorded his name. Mark doesn't usually name beneficiaries of miracles. He names only Jairus, the father of the 12-year-old girl whom Jesus raised from the dead. And you would have read that in chapter 7 if you've been reading through the Gospel of Mark. And then he names Bartimaeus in this passage. I only mention that because it, it could be that Bartimaeus is an active in the church and he's known to Mark's readers. He's only one of two people upon whom Jesus performed miracles who has their name mentioned. Bartimaeus chose to follow Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah, the anointed one. And I got to thinking about that. He chooses well. And my ADD kicks in sometimes. Do, do you remember the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? This is the sequel to the Temple of Doom, where, where Indiana searches for the Holy Grail, the, the cup from the original communion meal. He searches with his father, played by Sean Connery. Indiana Jones and the bad guys are all in a quest to find the Holy Grail. Supposedly, it's the cup Jesus used at the Last Supper. Both the good guys and the bad guys finally arrive at the cave where it's been kept safe by this ageless knight since the last crusade in the 13th century. According to the legend, anyone who would drink from the Holy Grail would have eternal life. Of course, of course that's just medieval myth mythology. It's, it's, it's no basis in truth. But there are several cups of varying descriptions all laid out for the eager questers to choose from. But the ageless knight warns, choose wisely. So the guy, bad guy's got a gun in his hand and he, he insists on being first to choose. And he's got this lovely assistant who's supposed to be an intimate archaeologist and, and she points us to, to this gilded goblet and he drinks from it. And in typical Steven Spielberg cinema special effects, his face melts away and that's the end of him. And the knight, the guardian of the Holy Grail says, he chose poorly. <laughs> the text today in Mark's gospel narrates the final episode of Jesus' ministry before he enters into Jerusalem to fulfill his father's will. I've already pointed out that the disciples and the rich young ruler had chosen poorly. They had come to Jesus and they tell him they want to ask him something. And Jesus asked them the same question he asked Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? In both instances, they choose poorly. The disciples want to sit at the right hand of Jesus, and the rich young ruler wants eternal life, but chooses his possessions over eternal life. See, we hear the same question put to the blind beggar in today's message. His response 
shows us how to choose wisely. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. My rabbi, the blind man, says, I want to see. And Jesus says to him, go forth. Your faith has healed you. And instantly the man can see, and he follows Jesus down the road. So picture this. Jesus is approaching his rendezvous with, with destiny in Jerusalem. He's going there to celebrate Passover with a crowd following him. He has to pass through these old town of Jericho. It was only 15 miles from the city walls of Jerusalem. As Jesus was hurrying along, the beggar Bartimaeus called out from his station by the side of the road, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Look, it's no doubt Bartimaeus had established his place along the side of the road for a long time. It wasn't unusual for beggars to position themselves there. In Jesus' day, even, even as they do today, everybody went through Jericho on the way to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. It was customary for beggars to set up on the side of the road because lots of people would be going by, and they could gain favor with God by being charitable. And those that were being, those that were begging benefited from that. The folks begging often lived off of what they got from Passover pilgrims for a long time. Bartimaeus must have heard about Jesus from the people who had passed him by on their way to Jerusalem. The poor beggar probably heard about all the miracles that Jesus had done and determined that if, if Jesus ever came by, if he ever came this way, he would do everything he could to get the rabbi's attention. He was desperate. And Jesus was his only hope of changing his miserable circumstances. Even though the people tried to shut him up, he called out even louder. Now, now up to this point in Mark's gospel, no one had ever called Jesus the son of David. It wasn't just a cliche. For the first century Jew, son of David was a title reserved only for the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. Now, it, it, it's important to note that Mark uses the term Son of David only once because he's writing primarily to the Gentiles. Luke, whose gospel is also written to the Gentiles, uses it twice. Matthew's gospel, that's written primarily for the Jewish nation, uses it 11 times. It's a term used for the coming Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the one prophesied about in the Old Testament, the one who would, who would save the Jewish nation. Bartimaeus recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah and he acts upon it. Earlier in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus asked Peter, Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. And Jesus, he warns Peter and everyone who heard him say that not to tell anybody. But when Bartimaeus yells out his Masonic title, Jesus doesn't stop him. The people tried to brush him aside, but Jesus affirms him and his declaration that he was indeed the Messiah, the son of David. The rabbi would no longer keep his messianic identity a secret. The passage says he stopped in his tracks and invited the desperate beggar to come to him. Having heard the invitation from Jesus, Bartimaeus abandoned his place and came rushing forward. Mark tells us that he threw his cloak aside, and that's not a small detail. Bartimaeus, no doubt, used his cloak like the other beggars did. They'd spread it out on the ground in front of them, and they'd catch coins that might be tossed their way. It was his sole means of support and his sole means of income. He was literally giving up everything that he had, everything that gave him security. Metaphorically, he was throwing away his old life as if, as he comes to Jesus. The old life no longer mattered and no matter meant anything to him. 
as he came rushing forward to meet the Savior. And Jesus greets him with a question. What do you want me to do for you? Choose what you want me to do for you. Now, that seems like a strange question to me. I mean, isn't it obvious what he needs? Hey, Jesus, I'm blind. I'm pretty sure Jesus knew what Bartimaeus wanted, but he also knew what he needed. Not only did he need healing from his blindness, he needed a savior. He needed the Messiah. He needed the son of David. Bartimaeus had never met Jesus, and yet he answers the question with this profound reply. Rabboni, he says, Rabboni. This is the same word Mary Magdalene used in John's gospel when she recognized Jesus had raised from the dead. Rabboni. It means my rabbi, my rabbi. It's a term of affection and, and commitment to the teacher. The radical faith of Bartimaeus is already evident when he makes his request, I want to see. Having recognized his remarkable faith, Jesus heals the man. He says, go. Your faith has healed you. And that's the end of the story, right? No, it's not. The inclusion of this narrative in Matthew, Mark, and Luke illustrates a perfect model of a disciple of Jesus Christ. After Bartimaeus encountered Jesus, his life was radically changed. Not only could he see, but he left everything in his former life and followed Jesus. How's that for an example for you and me? See, Mark's placement of the story of Bartimaeus at this point in his gospel is strategic. It most likely happened in the time frame that Mark and the other gospel writers place it, just before Jesus makes his entry into Jerusalem. Jesus accepted the title, Son of David, perfectly setting up the messianic meaning of the triumphant entry. But in addition, we observe the same question being asked of the sons of the, 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 of, of the disciples. In the previous story, in a similar dynamic, Jesus' dialogue with the rich young man before that, James and John wanted Jesus to fulfill their selfish request. They wanted to sit in seats of power. When Jesus came into his kingdom, they wanted to seat, sit at seats of power. Jesus, of course, refused their self-centered request and challenged them to reorient their lives to service. And when Jesus didn't initiate the conversation with the rich young man, but the man did want something from Jesus, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But the request of the disciples and the rich young man, they went away with their request unfulfilled. Yet the request of blind Bartimaeus was fully granted on the spot. He was granted sight and the ability to understand who the Messiah was. So, so what is it we can learn from this poor blind beggar? The first thing we can learn is he was desperate. He was desperate. He knew his condition was hopeless. You know, at the root of many of our spiritual problems, I believe, is that we don't realize how helpless and lost we are without the grace of God. We don't recognize our real need. We're too independent. We're self-righteous. Whether we articulate it or not, we believe we can solve our own issues. We can do that by our actions. We, we don't really need God. But the scripture tells us to humble ourselves so that he will lift us up. It's when we humble ourselves before God and recognize our de desperate need that he hears and responds to our cry. We must all recognize the need for our Savior, the Son of David, the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. We must recognize 
that our condition is hopeless. We need Jesus. We can't solve our own issues by following our own law. We need the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if we're to be saved. Second, Bartimaeus didn't care what others thought about his passion for Jesus. They told him to shut up. This is not the only time that people tried to keep others from Jesus. They tried to keep children away from Jesus too, and Jesus rebuked those that did. Remember I said that Jesus probably had a crowd traveling with him, listening to him teach as they walked to Jerusalem? So they didn't hear, want to hear somebody yelling. They had important things to do. They were listening to Jesus. They weren't worried about the beggar. Tell that guy to shut up. But Bartimaeus cried out all the louder. There will be people who try to dissuade you from pursuing Jesus. They'll rationalize with you about how he was a great teacher and set a great example, but they won't go so far as to recognize him as the son of David, the Messiah, the Christ. Oh, that's just religious stuff. That's a waste of time if you ask me. Or, man, you must be some kind of Jesus freak. You're weird. Good luck with that. You know, pursuing Jesus isn't as socially acceptable as it once was. Some of the faithful have paid unexpected prices for their beliefs lately. There was a teacher in New Jersey that was suspended for giving a student a Bible. There was a football coach in Washington that he's placed on leave for saying a prayer on the field at the end of a game. There was a fire chief in Atlanta that was fired for self-publishing a book defending his Christian moral beliefs. There was a Marine that was court-martialed for pasting a Bible verse above her desk. And, and, and there's other examples of the new intolerance. Anti-Christian activists hurl smears like bigot and hater at Americans who hold traditional beliefs of anti-abortion. They accuse Christians of waging a war on women. When I went to California recently and I told people that I was a pastor, they literally scoffed. Christianity is it's almost frowned upon. Jesus is passe in our culture. Listen to others and you'll never get to Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. And the third thing we can learn is this. Jesus was the most important thing in Bartimaeus' life. He threw aside his livelihood and his station in life to encounter Jesus. You know, the rich young ruler could have, could have learned a lesson from the lowly beggar, but the rich young ruler chose his possessions. Ultimately, Bartimaeus demonstrated his faith in Jesus. The passage says he threw off his coat and he ran to Jesus. Those that beg, like I said, would sit by the side of the road. They'd spread their cloak on the ground for people to throw their coins on. When he jumps up and goes to Jesus, he leaves his cloak, probably his livelihood, and he runs to Jesus. The Greek word here is apollonin. It means to cast aside. The, the cloak was important to the beggar. The cloak was as important to the beggar as a boat is to the fisherman. He runs to Jesus. He follows him along the road to Jerusalem. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. The word well here is sosokin. Sosokin. It's got the root word sosa. And it's got really kind of a happy ambiguity. It means healed. It can mean healed. It can mean made whole. It can mean saved. In Bartimaeus' case, all three are true. The man not only regained his sight and thereby his place in society, but he also becomes a follower of Jesus in the way. You got to ask yourself, the way to where? To Jerusalem? To the cross? And then ultimately, to the empty tomb. What do you want Jesus to do for you? 
What do you want the son of David, the Messiah, the anointed one, to do for you? His question is the same to you and me this morning as it was to Bartimaeus on the road to Jerusalem. What do you want me to do for you? Think carefully. Choose wisely. Let's all learn from Bartimaeus this morning. Let's choose well. Let's choose how we can make our request known to God. And then, let's be ready to have our eyes opened. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the story of Bartimaeus, the story of healing. We ask that you help us to choose wisely. Help us to choose Jesus as our Savior, depending on him for everything. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Jesus, have mercy, thou son of David, so did the blind man call to the Lord. Filled with great faith, he knew as he waited, Christ was his hope for vision restored. Jesus, have mercy, may we see clearly, you gave a gift we cannot repay, showing compassion, loving us dearly, even your Jesus, have mercy when we are doubting, hiding our talents high on our shelves. As we bend blessed, may we be an offering, healing your In just a minute, we will conclude our time together with our benediction song. But right now, I encourage you to watch this brief video on ways that you can give to the ministry of our church. There are many ways that you can give toward the mission of Broadmoor. You can go to broadmoormethodist.org slash giving to give safely and securely online. You can text BE MORE to 73256. And of course, you can also mail checks to our physical address at 10230 Molly Lee Drive, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70815. My friends, may you grow in and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. My friends, may you grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory now and forever now and forever amen to god be the glory now and forever now and forever amen